I'm Rick Halsey with the Chaparral Institute, and we're here at Daily Ranch today to explore and listen to animal interactions with the environment. There's birds, there's mammals, there's insects, there's all sorts of things, but you have to kind of pay attention with the ear mostly because most of the time you don't see them, but you do hear them. So one of the key things you hear at Daily Ranch are the birds. A lot of flits, a lot of little peeps, and when you hear these things, what's kind of fun to do is try to record them in a journal. And I'll give you a couple examples. For the acorn woodpecker, it has this raw ha kind of sound. And so you can write raw ha on a little line that goes up twice, ra ha, ra ha. And you gotta do it quick if you're gonna replicate it. So it's ra ha, <laughs> That's how the acorn woodpecker sounds, it's a call. Another one is a wren tit, W-R-E-N-T-I-T, -E wren tit. And it's a little gray bird with a long tail. It's a wonderful little bird, lives in the chaparral. They live for about 10 years. They have a call that sounds, or rather has a rhythm of a bouncing ping pong ball. Kind of goes like. What we just heard there was a scrub jay. And so listening, there he is again. So listening to the birds is a great way to learn about nature. Scrub jays are the blue birds that people call blue jays, but in fact, blue jays don't exist in California. They're Eastern coast birds. We have scrub jays. What we have here are acorns stuck in this post with holes without acorns. And you're wondering, how did they get here? These are placed here by acorn woodpeckers. They live in colonies of 10 to 20 or so, 20s on the high side. And they just love to be together. It's big families. They help raise each other's young. But the most interesting thing is this acorn storage habit. And so they'll put these acorns in these holes and come back during the winter and they'll eat the acorns as well as the insects that are attracted to the acorns. And the funny thing is, you'd think that they're thinking about storing these acorns for the future and that's more of a human behavior or a human characteristic is planning ahead. What birds do and, and most animals, they just do what they do and they survive that way. They don't really think about it too much. And the reason we know this is because there's a tree in Santa Barbara that's got holes in it just like this that were drilled by acorn woodpeckers, but there's no acorns <laughs> in the holes. There's little rocks. The whole tree is full of rocks. And so something happened to the acorn woodpecker's brain. There was a mutation or something that happened in its genetics that made it not consider what was going into the little holes. And so that particular colony, if things get really tough in terms of survival stresses, they may not be around anymore after that year because they don't have an acorn storage to, to go back to. So here, if you take a look at this area, you'll notice there's little clusters of weird seed-like materials. And if you look right here, there's a little burrow and that's where the red harvester ant lives. It's California's most distinctive native ant. And let's knock on the door to bring out a few more.
Here they come. So they collect seeds, take off the loose parts, and take the actual seed into the burrow, and they use that for food. So one of the interactions out in the wilds that goes on here at Daly Ranch is that the red harvester ants is the key food for the horn lizard, or often known as the horny toad lizard, those little flat, kind of fun dinosaur looking creatures. And they eat these as part of their main diet. Unfortunately, if this is anywhere near a building or a suburban development, for example, there's gonna be Argentine ants, which are non-native ants. They, they're the ones you see in your kitchen. They invade these ant colonies here. They'll kill all the red harvester ants and they literally rip them from limb to limb. They're so tiny, there'll be 10 or 12 of those Argentine ants attacking each individual red ant. And then it wipes out the colony and that removes the food for the horned lizard. But these are beautiful animals and they're fun to watch. They do sting, they do bite, but you can keep a safe distance. Nice talking to you all. Rattlesnakes. What do rattlesnakes have to do with Mission Manzanita? All right, so you've probably heard about the, the, the fox and the snowshoe hare in the Arctic and how they have a up and down kind of relationship, predator prey. Well, there's something going on here too with rattlesnakes and Mission Manzanita. Now, Mission Manzanita is not the prey of the rattlesnake, but something is, and this is what's important. The little rodents in the chaparral, what they do is they get these berries of Mission Manzanita and all the other plants that particularly have seeds that they can gather, and they cache them in the ground in little stacks, and they bury them up. And so when fires come, the seeds are just at the right depth to survive the fire, either not burn or to be properly stimulated by the smoke, the chemicals in the smoke, or, or the heat. Now the question is, what's the rattlesnake got to do with this? Well, if all the rodents were still around and they remembered where they cached all the seeds, there wouldn't be any seedlings after fires for the most part because the rodents had gone back and eaten them. The rattlesnakes and other animals that prey on rodents like hawks, they keep the population controlled so that these seeds that are cached in the soil are forgotten or they, nobody knows they're there. And so after a fire, they'll all germinate in little clusters. And you'll see this often with Ceanothus and uh, some of the other uh, manzanitas. Not this one particularly, but some of the other ones. And so rattlesnakes are essential for this shrub to be properly distributed and survive. One of my favorite animal evidences in Daly Ranch is the wood rat nest. These are wonderful little creatures. The females run the nest, run the whole society as a matter of fact. They have their family and the female babies, they get older and they stay with mom in the nest for the most part for a lot longer than the males do. And the males kind of get kicked out of the nest and roam the chaparral and the oak woodlands with nasty attitudes looking for their own territory. But these mounds can get pretty big. And they've done some studies with some of these mounds in desert environments. And some of these mounds are upwards to 10,000 years old. So down deep, you can get fossil evidence of pollen of the types of flowers and plants that used to exist back in the day. And you can find out how the environment's changed by looking at the fossilized pollen, which is actually embedded in fossilized urine, <laughs> which isn't a very pleasant thought, but it does a great job fossilizing things. So this is a wood rat nest. They have little hairy tails, cute little white spots, especially on their feet, and very big ears. Here we have a fun little arthropod that most people don't recognize as little more than just a, like a wad of spit on a plant. And if you take a look at it, there's a little, almost a cocoon of frothy material here. And inside this little froth is a creature called a spittle bug. And what they do is they suck the juices out of the plant and they excrete them out of the rear end. <laughs> and that's pretty not what most people are gonna wanna go mess with. So they have created this protective area here. And inside, we'll take a look and see what he looks like. Oh, so there's two of them in here. If you can see that little dark spot, that's the head. And he has a little yellow rump. And there's two. There's one at the top that's smaller than the one at the bottom. And he's trying to get away. But there he is. That's a spittle bug. Let's see if we can get him on my finger. Get a closer look at him. 
And what these fellows do, here he is, what these fellows do is they eventually uh, become adults, they have wings, and they fly away to find another home for their babies. So this is a spittle bug. Front end is dark, rear end is yellow. And that's the part where all the spittle comes out. There is a metal mark butterfly, and he or she is putting her proboscis or his proboscis right down into the flower head of that golden bush blossom. I love the way the colors are on the back of the wing. So, as you probably know, many insects are very important pollinators, and this metal mark butterfly is a native butterfly that's very important for this particular plant. And the thing is, what, what are they doing there? Why, why are they <laughs> pulling the nectar out for the plant, you're wondering? Well, it's not for the plants. For them, they get food, but they also get coated by pollen, and then they go to the next flower and drop off the pollen there. And that's how the flower gets pollinated. So these insects we're seeing here play a very important part in the environment by pollinating, helping flowers produce seeds in that way. And this is why it's really important not to spray pesticides and all the poisons sometimes we put in the environment because these little animals are very sensitive. It doesn't take much to hurt them. And without them, basically, you just wouldn't have too many flowers left, if any at all. And then those flowers produce seeds, which are eaten by all sorts of creatures. This is Ceanothus. It's a very interesting plant. This particular one, you'll notice the leaves are kind of curly. It doesn't look particularly pretty right now, but this is actually when it's showing off its best talents, surviving long-term drought. And the plant leaves point up and they curl up just to keep the sun off of them as much as they can. But the interesting thing about these plants is the seeds. So they have little clusters up in here. The seeds are all gone now. And the little cluster pods, there's three little marks here and that's where the seeds were. And as the year gets drier and drier and drier, these seeds, they pop. And I've been walking by seeing Othus shrubs in the summer sometimes and I keep getting hit in the head with little tiny seeds because they pop off of here as a way to distribute themselves away from the shrub. And when the seeds land on the ground, it rains the next year and guess what happens? Nothing. Next year, what happens? Nothing. Next year, nothing. They'll stay on the ground for a century or more. We don't really know how long they can survive because they're cued to germinate by the heat of fire. There's a little tiny pore on the Ceanothus seed that gets modified when it gets heated by fire, which allows, what do you think, to get into the seed? Water. And once water gets into the little embryo in the seed, it takes off. Now, it doesn't necessarily need fire to germinate. It's just that it's ready. It's like fire insurance. It's not like you don't want your house to burn down because you have fire insurance. You just have it just in case. Same thing with these plants. They're not sitting there in the soil, their seeds anyway, saying, burn me, burn me. That's just not the way it is. They're just waiting because they know a fire will come, which is an integral part of the chaparral, just as long as it doesn't come too frequently. And what, what does that mean? Well, if there's more fires than once per 30 years or so, these shrubs, they're just, they, they can't produce enough seed to get back into the soil to survive after the next fire. So the fires have to be at least 30 to 40 years apart to really guarantee a proper Ceanothus regeneration. So the seeds just sit there and, and you often think, why would a seed not want to germinate it if it got watered? Well, because if it germinated right now under the chaparral canopy here, guess what would happen? A bunny would eat it or it would die because there's not enough sunshine or, or water. So it just waits till after a fire, and what's, what's going on? Well, the bunnies are dead, <laughs> there's sunshine everywhere, and it starts to rain in the late fall. So these plants are especially adapted to the chaparral environment in a way that most people um, really don't know. The fire story at Daly Ranch is pretty important because fire is an integral part of all of Southern California's ecosystems and habitats and plant communities. 
in Daly Ranch in particular, there's a lot of different habitats and each habitat has its own unique relationship to fire. This has been complicated, unfortunately, by human activity. There's more fires now than there ever used to be. And so that's caused a lot of our ecosystems to be ser seriously damaged. And you often hear how chaparral or certain habitat types need fire. That may have been true a long time ago before humans started lighting so many fires, but now that's just not the case. So there's more fires in Southern California and potentially on Daly Ranch than the ecosystem can actually survive. So chaparral in particular is very sensitive to timing of fires. It's gotta happen when it's dry. It's gotta happen no more than every 30 to 40 years. The natural fire return interval for chaparral is anywhere from 30 to 150 years. Now in some places every 10, chaparral can't survive that kind of frequency. Then you think about grasslands. They're a little more forgiving with fire because they don't have all those woody shrubs that have to create the seeds and store it up in the seed bank in the soil. So they can uh, have a, a little bit more fire than, than chaparral. Then you get into oak woodlands and oak woodlands, which are the forests in Daly Ranch, they usually are involved with chaparral fires because the chaparral is right next to it. And oftentimes the fire kind of goes underneath the oaks and it doesn't burn up into the crown where all the leaves are. And if it does, oaks re-sprout and they come back beautifully. So each system has its own special relationship. So you can't really make a general statement about fire. You really have to look at each system because once you do, you find out the magic of the relationship between all these things that happen in nature, climate, fire, interactions with plants and animals. And once you do, it's really a fascinating story. And I hope you've learned a lot about that here at Daily Ranch. So next time you come out here, bring a pair of binoculars and, and, and your ears and your nose and, and, and watch and interact with the plants and the animals yourself in terms of how you observe them and discover the stories that just sort of emerge and think about how things interrelate with each other. Because most of us usually see the plant or the animal. We don't really make the connection between the two. And there's fascinating stories out here. There's the rodents and the mission manzanita berries, the ceanothus seeds that are buried, and they help continue the line of these shrubs and the rattlesnakes that, that control those rodents and the acorn woodpeckers that collect acorns and put them into holes in, in, in trees and, and telephone poles, which provides a habitat for insects, which then they eat also. And there's a whole list of things, even little harvester ants that interact with each other and, and the environment and collect seeds. Where do those seeds go? And they actually distribute seeds too. So it isn't just one thing or the other, it's an inter weaving web. And that's what's so fascinating about Daily Ranch and any place in nature. It's a large storybook with so many stories. So go on out and take a look at the stories that you find interesting and enjoy yourself at Daily Ranch. Mm -hmm.